All right. Well, evening, everybody. Um, I tip my hat to you. It's the summer and you're attending a CE webinar. So I think that's really awesome. Um, I've got a few announcements to make and then I'm going to turn the floor over to Jeff and let Jeff introduce himself. If you've never joined us before, welcome. So a few announcements. Next month's webinar is going to be on the 21st of July. It's going to be on patient assessment. Um, Mel Oakley is going to be teaching that. And then we have a whole lot of workshops coming up in September. So we have a CADS workshop, a certified ambulance docu documentation specialist course um, with PWW that is being offered through our office. We have a 12 lead ECG and capnography course. We're bringing in Bob Page to teach that. That's gonna be in Traverse City. That's a two day event. So that's also open for registration. I've included all of this in your email as well. And then we also have an introduction to quality assurance workshop that also is going to be in Traverse City um, as well. Last, we have our EMS Leadership Academy that registration has opened. Um, that is starting to fill. As soon as it's full, registration will come down. That is going to be beginning in October of this year and it's gonna be in beautiful Marquette and it will conclude in Marquette in April. That is a um, eight plus, plus month class with eight in-person mandatory days. The center covers all costs except for hotel. So if you're interested, shoot me an email. So lots of good things coming up through the center this year. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I am turning the floor over to you. So my name is Jeff Callard. The reason we have this up here is at the end, We'll play a quick little game called Kahoot. If you haven't done it, it's a lot of fun. The questions are impossibly hard, but the prizes uh, will be a gift certificate on Amazon. But it's a lot of fun. And really at the end, all you have to do is put in kahoot.it and it'll bring it up where you'll just add the code that I'll give you. But it's a lot of fun. It's, it's really not hard, it's just fun. Um, my name is Jeff Callard. I practice emergency medicine for 32, 33 years. Um, I started in a two-bed ER in southern Michigan, and then I moved up to a 100-bed ER in uh, Flint, Michigan. So currently, I'm the uh, director of the advanced practice providers uh, at St. Joe Mercy Hospital, and I'm also the director of emergency medicine fellowship for NPs, PAs, and non-board certified doctors. So we have basically like a residency for PAs, NPs, and non-certified physicians. So I've been in Ann Arbor for about 15, coming on 20 years, um, which I enjoy. I also work at a couple small hospitals, Chelsea, which is about a 25,000 visit. And I've worked uh, at just recently at Sparrow and some other hospitals. I help out my group when needed. Um, so as always, we have no disclosures. I don't own any stock in any of the drugs or equipment here. Um, I don't have any, uh, any kind of uh, problems with uh, you know, giving anything away, but if you know somebody who's willing to pay me, I'd be happy to do that. So let's start out because I got a lot of information to cover and, and some of it's a lot of fun. And I know I started out, and everybody says this, but I did start out as an EMT specialist back in the 1980s when I was in college. I worked in Gratiot County, um, which is a little bit smaller county, not as rural as some of you folks maybe up in the UP. And so I have great love and respect for EMS people, and that's why I've uh, enjoyed doing this for a few years. I try to give you a little perspective on some different things. I know what you guys do is super important. And as you get longer transports, it's even more important. I wanna sprinkle in some things I think that you'll be able to do in the future, uh, which I've talked about in the past. Uh, Ann Arbor has a paramedic program that does home visits. Uh, they've even talked about having PAs and NPs on the ambulance with the paramedics doing home visits and, and dis, you know, basically discharging pay, patients from the sites. Other states do that right now. So we're trying, our company is very innovative, and I hope to work with some of you guys maybe in doing some of this fun stuff. But I want to bring a case, and this will be actually, it's our first case, sort of the teaser, but it's actually the last case we're going to talk about. And this is going to be a kid who is in rural North America. And when I say rural, 
you guys don't know what rural is compared to what these are. And I'll, I'll give you more details as we go along. This is a four-year-old Cree patient, and Cree is not the people on the, uh, what is it, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Cree are the people who are a North American Indian group, uh, Cree Indians, basically. And it's a four-year-old female who the EMS gets a call to the house, uh, a very rural American, and they bring him into their hospital, which was like the one I started in, two beds with no equipment other than an x-ray and a respiratory therapist in a lab, no CTs, no MRIs, no, no anesthesiologist, no, nobody but really a small ER. Uh, this patient's vital signs look good. They're breathing clear but they're sitting there very quietly and calm. And they kind of look like this picture over here. Um, so they aren't your normal four-year-old right now and they don't speak English. So there's translators there. And this again, sent to this um, ER triage and to be seen by us in a few minutes. So what I wanna do, one of the things is gonna just bring some of the stuff we do once you bring them in as well as maybe things you can do, okay? I can't see any of you. So if you have any questions, I always have a, at each case, we'll have a few minutes to talk about any questions you have. And we'll have a, hopefully a little time at the end. I will stay on. I have nothing to do tonight, but go to bed since I worked late last night and got a dentist appointment early this morning. So I will stay on. And if anybody has any questions and my email is at the very end of this, so you can email a question too. Okay. So the second case, the first case we'll really talk about is a three-year-old who wakes up with shortness of breath. You're called to the scene and you arrive and there's a four-year-old there. They're kind of coughing and hacking and having trouble breathing. Uh, I know you guys don't see that too much. The interesting thing is I haven't seen anything like this in a year with uh, COVID, almost a year and a half now. Um, so that's our first case we'll really talk about. The second one will be a 16-year-old with shortness of breath, you guys are called to the scene once again, vague symptoms. God, God bless you on the vague symptoms. At least I have time to order tests and x-rays and things, but you guys try to figure things out with very limited information. So patient's got a fever, loss of taste and smell, which may be a key to some things that have been going on recently. Their set is for a 16 year old healthy male is incredibly low. You don't see this very often, but they don't look terrible. So what are you gonna do next on that one? The third case is a female with abdominal pain, something we never see in the ER in St. Joe. Uh, they rarely come in for abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. That's a very rare problem. Uh, they have a low grade fever. They can't keep anything down. Their pain is in the right upper quadrant. And what are you gonna do for them on your ambulance? And what am I gonna do them once they get to the ER? And then the next one is going to be a 15-year-old with some chest pain. He was out running a, uh, a tall, skinny kid who was out running the mile in gym class and suddenly started having this sharp chest pain. And he says it hurts to breathe and cough and he's really short of breath. So think about what you're going to do with this kid, okay? So let's start with our first case. And as you guys know, there's cases that 99% of them are fine. They do just great when you see them, when I see them, and when they go home. But there's just those couple that keep you up at night and scare the living crap out of you. So um, these, you know, this one may kind of lean that way. So you're called to the uh, house of a three-year-old male. He started coughing over the last few days and it's gotten much, actually started today, sorry. He started today coughing and wheezing and mom just doesn't know what's going on. Then she noticed him drooling, his shirt's all soaking wet. And he's like my little Cree kid here is sitting there very still, not acting like your normal three-year-old yelling and crying and running around and playing. He tries to, you try to speak to the patient, but he won't talk to you. He just kind of looks at you like, hey, what do you want me to do? He's had the cough and runny nose for six days, but he has gotten much worse today, the mom tells you. And he's had a fever for a couple of days, nothing real high, maybe 100, 101. Um, not eating or drinking very well. Just, just one of those patients that makes you feel a little nervous, okay? So you go ahead and do your vital signs and you got a temp of 104, a little higher than you thought. He's breathing along a little faster than you expect, maybe 45 to 50. And his sat's lower than you'd like to see in a young child. You know, so, so as the uh, 
the intensivist would tell you, you're starting to pucker up a little bit down low here. Okay. You're getting nervous. He's sitting still. He's sitting on mom's lap. He's just kind of sitting there staring at you. He's not saying anything. He's not making much noise. He's kind of leaning forward a little bit. He's got a little bit of strider, which we'll talk about in a minute if you don't remember what that is. But strider is one of the things that when I hear it in the ER, the hair raises on the back of my neck. Okay. His clothing, like we talked about, is a little wet from his drooling. His lung sounds clear, but he's got this weird squeaky sound in his throat. His abdomen seems to be okay. The kid's a little anxious which also makes you anxious because you want to see the kid that's, you know, maybe crying is better than not crying sometimes. Okay. So what would you do next? So, you know, there's not much you can do there. You got, you maybe put him on some O2, you keep him still. We'll talk about what other things you might do and what things you shouldn't do. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about Strider and I, I will apologize ahead of time if my link doesn't work very well, or if I screw something up. So Strider, if you've never heard it in your life, and you may not have, because Strider is become a little bit more rare than it used to be. Strider is usually upper airway, very high pitched. I hate to do it to even make the sound because it makes me short of breath. Okay. Uh, but it's kind of this <sighs> sound. Okay. And that should make your everything get excited and nervous. Okay. Because that's the sound you don't want to hear. Now, occasionally it's nothing to worry about but occasionally it's something more frightening than you can imagine, okay? I'm gonna try this link, we'll see what happens, cross our fingers. Mastery Medics is like having the cheat codes for EMT and paramedic school. I mean, where else are you gonna find? We'll just do this for a second here. Strider is a scary sound that is indicative of a severely narrowed or obstructed airway. It is most often in the upper airway and often needs rapid medical intervention. All right, let me get back. So if you hear this sound on your kid, you need to, you need to be a little concerned. So what are the things that come in your mind when this, you hear this sound? Well, terror is my first one. The, fir the other ones are croup kind of sounds like this and we'll kind of compare the two uh we always talk i think we've talked in the past about airway foreign bodies so when we talked about asthma so something obstructing the upper airway a toy or food that'll cause that sound uh, mononucleosis believe it or not can cause some uh swelling in the throat an anaphylactic reaction or angioedema they got stung by a bee they ate the the peanuts they're not supposed to eat epiglottitis, which I'm going to actually expand a little bit more on, and then any kind of upper airway abscess or mass or, you know, occasionally you'll get a, dent, believe it or not, a dental abscess, which will get so large, it'll cause airway problems and you can get that strider. So strider is one of the things that should really bring, get your attention when you, uh, when you uh, hear it, okay? So croup is the one you see a lot. Now, again, honestly, I saw my croup, first croup patient in a year and a half, just two weeks ago when I worked at Chelsea Emergency Department. I hadn't seen croups or upper respiratory infections in a year and a half. So it was sort of a surprise and pleasant surprise, okay? So croup is usually uh, three years old, roughly or less. And epiglottitis, which is a more terrifying one we'll talk about in a second, is two to six-year-olds. Croup comes on gradually, and epiglottitis, epiglottitis is a little excuse me, a little bit more rapid onset. And, and we're talking about these two is they sign up, present a little film similar, but this is the differences. So croup is a virus. Epiglottitis is, is actually caused by a antibiotic, or I'm sorry, bacteria caused Haemophilus influenza B. And that is not a virus, even though it's got influenza in it. Somebody decided to call it that. And Haemophilus influenza V, we're going to talk a little bit more about, but H, H flu is actually something we don't see too much anymore because we have something called a Hib vaccine, the Haemophilus, Haemophilus influenza B vaccine. So I used to see epiglottitis very frequently when I started, when I worked up in Flint. Um, but since the Hib vaccine came back, I rarely see it. But now we're getting more of these anti-vaxxer people. And this is going to come back a little bit. And this is going to scare the living heck out of you. 
Usually the croupy kids are a little lower fevers the, and the hypoglottitis are sick looking. They're tripoding, whereas the uh, croupy patients, you know, they're the squeaky barky. They have some retractions. They will have strider, um, but not quite as bad as the epiglottitis. And until you see it, you won't remember it. The, uh, epig the uh, croupy kid is a little horse. He's the one you put him in a cold, uh, you know, the parents freak out. They hear this terrible sound. They bring him outside in the middle of the winter. And by the time they get to you, you know, if they kind of call the ambulance to take them outside, they're they're, they're, they're crouping or their uh, barking is a little better because the cold air seems to improve it, okay? But in the epiglottitis, these kids will be muffled. And what we call that in, in emergency medicine, and one I didn't know when I graduated from PA school, but it's a muffled sound. It's not a hoarse sound, but it's a muffled sound. They call it hot potato breath. And what it's like is if you put a hot potato at the base of your tongue, you can talk like this. So that's what it sounds like. It's a really either a muffled, quiet sound, or it's this hot potato breath. And they'll have drooling, and they'll really, it hurts to try to even swallow. So that's why they drool so much. And usually the croupy kids, you look in their throats, and you won't see much of anything. The epiglottitis people, we're going to talk a little bit more before we look in their throat. So if you're lucky enough to come to ER, if you have x-rays on your ambulance, which you probably don't, the croupy kid will look like this. And this is called a steeple sign on their x-ray. And it looks like this. And you don't need to do the x-ray for this, but it looks like a little steeple if you can see right here. So that's really the narrowing area of the airway. Epiglottitis is, if you guys remember your anatomy, and I'll go over this a little more with a different picture, is the epiglottis is actually... This is the vollecula. This is where you put your Macintosh blade when you're doing an, uh, an intubation. And this is the kind of the prominence above it. And this is called a thumb printing. So if you put your thumb right over, this is big and fat. Whereas if you looked at a cross table of the croupy kid, it'll be normal. So I kind of want to give you a perspective of what we're looking at. Why this one's a little epiglottitis is a little worse than croup, even though they may be miserable each way. Okay, so the... Um, what we do and what you might consider is there, there's an app that's free on your phone called MD Calc and, and we use it in the ER and you might use it for asthma scales or this West, Wesley's croup scale. And it's this little uh, scale that kind of from their symptoms, you kind of decide how sick they are and what you can do even in the ambulance to start them out, okay? So what this what we're talking about is this croupy sound is actually coming from the trachea, not up here. This is the vollecula. This is where this is where the epiglottis is. If you can see my little arrow here in this kid's neck, the the strider that the kids are getting here is from croup, and that's from a little bit lower near the trachea. So that's why there's a little different sound. Okay, um, so some of the EMS. Whoops. Oh no, a little sensitive. Some of the EMS uh, groups in the bigger towns and even some of the smaller ones that are have big transfer delays are doing some telemedicine stuff. So, you know, we can take a look in the throat or we may be able to see something or you can describe what you're seeing. We can start something. So using the croup scale and I won't bore you with it, but uh, basically it looks well, I will bore you with it a little bit. It looks at retractions. It looks at strider. Are they agitated? Or are they having strider when they're only agitated, kind of crying or at rest? Are they having mild, moderate, and severe uh, retractions, which you know are the little where you can see their ribs uh, when you see them breathing? Are they blue with agitation at rest or no? Are they confused or are they normal? And is their air entry is are they entering air? How's the sound? It's really they sound loud or is it really muffled, quiet? So that is kind of how the scale is and then you you just fill in the what you see and it'll give you a number and if the number's less than two most of the time it's just humidified air on the ambulance occasionally some of you guys i know have decadron on there so you might you know if you have medical um a control that you can talk to um you uh could maybe give them some decadron and actually what we do is we take iv ecadron decadron sorry iv decadron we squirt it in a little bit of syrup and we give it to them by mouth. We don't give it to an IV. And then albuterol, I'll never, ever, ever fault you for trying it um, because, you know, they're croupy. They're maybe a little wheezy sounding. Maybe it's hard to tell. 
So I'll never fault you for doing it, but the studies show it probably doesn't help and it may make it a little worse sounding, but it really won't make the disease worse, okay? Uh, when you get a moderate, a little sicker kid, you'll continue. A humidified air is the big thing uh, to start out with. Decadron, again, is the treatment. And then some of you called it racemic epinephrine. I think some of you probably have it, if not all of you on the rigs, if you are, um, darn it, if you are um, an advanced unit. And that's just some epinephrine you put in a nebulizer and you give it to them. And then they can have some rebound, but it really does, as epinephrine does, it opens up the airway for you. Okay, and then they do better. And sometimes we'll admit these kids and sometimes we'll monitor them for a few hours and send them home. Okay, so again, you can help us out by getting some of these things started. If they're pretty severe, then you gotta keep the kid comfortable. You wanna do the humidified oxygen. The dry oxygen won't help. You want humidified air or humidified oxygen. And some of you guys may now be getting this uh, high flow nasal cannula, which is heated and humidified. So that may help. But the most important thing is more than the oxygen is humidification. Put it through the bubbler. Again, dexamethasone, racemic epinephrine. Treat their fever. If they have a fever and you have acetaminophen, give them a little acetaminophen. Give, if they can tolerate oral liquids, you can give them some oral liquids. IV fluids will be fine too. That'll hydrate them up a little bit. And then we can always repeat it, especially you guys that have the long transports. We may need to give a second dose of epinephrine after a few hours. If, and I know some of you may have had in the winter hour transportation. And then God forbid you get to the impending respiratory failure. You need to just let the hospital know you're coming, let, you know, let them know that the kid is really sick. Uh, run fast. Um, intubation in these kids can be almost impossible to near impossible. You may have to use a really small pediatric tube if you can even get one to, if you take a look and you can even see one. Uh, inform the receiving center that you may need ENT or anesthesia at the place or if, if able to, and you have a little bit of a choice and it's not too much farther, you may consider going to the PZR. So this is croup. Um, so, but our kid was more of the sicker as we compared the two, okay? And I'm gonna keep an eye on the clock because I feel like I'm already getting behind. So this kid was febrile, this kid was tachypnic and his, um, his uh, pulse ox is 92%. He's not moving, he's not saying anything, he's looking more like that epiglottitis, okay? So, and he's anxious and so are you getting anxious. So epiglottitis is, again, this area right over here on our side view, the epiglottis. There's the vollecula right in here. Okay, that's where you put your MAC blade. But this is, the, uh, this is the epiglottis, and this thing turns into a thumb. So imagine this thing big and fat, and look what it does to this airway. Now, this is an adult picture. Just imagine what it does to a little tiny airway, okay? There's no epiglottitis scale. Epiglottitis is epiglottitis, and it's... It is not good. It's the area actually below the molecula, not above it. I apologize for that. This is a life-threatening problem, and this is one that we get very nervous about in the ER, and you should be nervous. Again, like we talked about, H flu is the H flu or Haemophilus influenza is the bug. Prevention is the most important thing you can do, and that's have your kids get the Hib vaccine. Um, the kid didn't get it, and they have it. Not much you can do once they're on the rig. This is one of those cases where you do not want to look at this kid's throat, okay? Any kind of agitation of this kid, any kind of, you know, you put the tongue blade, oh, sorry about that, you put the tongue blade in there and through their mouth and you can see there's the epiglottis and you put the tongue blade if, or the laryngoscope blade here, you're going to be close to touching in it and that may cause that to swell up or close what little airways are left. So these were the ones that made all the ER people really, really nervous because they could just go from kind of looking really sick to arresting because they had no airway at all, okay? So your job, my job, and even in the ER is keep the kid calm, try to get some humidified oxygen or humidified air on him, keep that area moist. You may go with a bag valve mask um, just to kind of get them a little bit of air, softly, gently pushing on it. If you have steroids on it, give them 120, you know, give them steroids. I don't care how much, uh, don't worry about that. The main thing on this kid is you want to let them know you got a sick kid. He sounds like he's got the strider. He's not moving air. He's sitting and looking sick. He's, a, he's febrile. You wanna again, let the hospital know that you got a sick kid. 
and they should be ready for intubation or a crike. Um, and crikes are frightening. And I don't have, I have never done one, thank God. And maybe some of you had, but they are very frightening and scary, especially on a little kid. Okay. So this is epiglottitis and, and croup. And we talked a little bit about each. So um, any specific questions now, I'm going to make it short, but if not, I'm going to go ahead. And again, the Bonus question for med school's um, application or boards is, what's that hanging downy thing in the back of your throat? If you guys don't know Larson, then these may not be as funny, but he was a, a cartoon guy a few years ago. Six, yes, so I do have a question for you. Please, I don't, I don't see the chat either, so go ahead. Not a problem. I can, I can definitely, I'll mod moderate those for you. Um, so the question is, what is the number value based on for mild, severe, et cetera? And I think that was for your scale that you were. Yeah, for the scale, it's it's on your visual scale of these the symptoms we talked about before, the Wesley criteria, Wesley criteria. So that little app I told you about, you can find a paper app of that. So you look at those things and you add up the number at the end. Are they retracting? How's their cough? Are they moving air? And then you use that number to kind of fit your treatment for them. And it's, you know, you will, you will amaze the uh, medical directing people or the ER PAs or docs or NPs if you say, hey, I got a kid, he's crouping and his Wesley scale is X and we're bringing him in on humidified air. So that'll make you even smarter than I know you guys already are. But it's just basically using that app or using that criteria and then putting a number to it. So if you use the app and you say, well, they're not retracting and it'll give you a zero. So just add the number up. And then at the bottom of this app or other apps similar, it'll tell you the number and then you can kind of guide your treatment from there. So that's where it comes from. And I can show you that again a little bit later if you want to hang on. So hopefully that answers it. And if not, at the end, I'll talk again. 16 year old male comes to the ER or comes calls the ambulance, mom calls the ambulance because he's got a fever and he looks miserable. He, he doesn't look sick and you guys know the difference. I think what I mean by that, he doesn't look like he feels good but he doesn't look like he's gonna die on you in the next few minutes, okay? So loss of taste and smell, that may be something you've experienced or you know about recently and it sets incredibly low for a kid this age, okay? So you get called to the scene. And so what are you gonna do when you get to the scene? You're gonna get in your uh, PPE, correct? You're gonna call, you know, they, you're called to this home. You're gonna get yourself all gowned up. He's short of breath and coughing. He's complaining of body aches. He's got a loss of taste and smell. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea didn't start out to be the symptoms, became actually in our ER a little bit more than actually some of the respiratory symptoms. He feels miserable. Everything hurts. His hair hurts. His teeth hurt. You know, he just feels crappy and he's real short of breath, but he doesn't, he looks like he's moving air pretty good. Started about 20, 20, 20 minutes or 24 hours ago yesterday, and he doesn't really have any health problems. Okay. So you get a temp, it's a febrile. And that's actually been most of my experience. I've seen very few people like this who have fevers. His heart rate's pretty fast, 130. His respiratory rate's a little on the high side and his sat's pretty low for you. You're thinking, what the heck is going on here? Though you've probably seen a hundred of these people. His pressure looks good. He doesn't look toxic, but he looks short of breath. Breath sounds are decreased. No wheezing or rouse that you can hear. His belly's tender all over. He's having diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Uh, he's having muscle aches, but it's not really anything specific. So what are you going to do? Well, obviously, if he's got a fever, you're going to give him temp. If it sets 90, 85%, you know, I use 92% now. That's the, the studies are showing 92% is when you want to start the oxygen on him. So 92%, you put him on some oxygen. I would add, no, I have been giving and I would never fault anybody for giving them uh, either an albuterol treatment or two puffs on an inhaler, which is what we've been doing more of right recently. And listen, uh, fluids, his heart rates, he's tachycardic, you know, he kind of looks dry because he's breathing so fast. So I would have no problems with that. So again, O2, IV fluids. Breathing treatment, plus minus, sometimes they feel great, sometimes they don't. You might consider an EKG because he's tachycardic to look at his rhythm. And I think that's about all you can do and transport him in, protecting yourself, of course. When I do an h and I don't see anything, but he says he's not been wearing a mask with his friends and he's been hanging out like he's not supposed to. You guys did such a good job. You did most of my h and for me. We suit him up. We remember our O2 criteria, which is 92%. 
I do a swab on him and uh, surprisingly enough, he's got COVID. Um, his white count is almost always, I can tell you of the hundreds of COVID patients I saw over the winter and or the whole year, I have had one person with an elevated white count. That is it, one person. The rest, the labs are pretty normal. Uh, the COVID's always po you know, positive and they feel terrible, um, but you can hydrate them up and get them feeling better. One of the reasons though I brought this up is not to kind of get you on stuff you've been seeing, but to kind of see how bad things really are on some of these patients. So the chest x-ray on the left is a chest x-ray of a normal person. On the right is a not so sick COVID patient. You can see the difference. Black is air and white is, you know, tissue. So you can see the heart here and you can see the lungs, the big black things here in the ribs, you know, and the shoulders. But you see this guy has patchy infiltrates everywhere. And if we did a CT scan or what you described, this is ground glass appearance. I know. So if you have ever seen like fiberglass, this is kind of what it looks like on an x-ray fiberglass, sort of that, you know, interlocking tissues and stuff. So these people have been amazing to me. I've been doing this 30 some years and I have never seen x-rays this horrible on people who sat slow, but they don't look bad at all. So I want to give you a perspective on what we're seeing in these people. They look terrible. Okay. So one thing that I keep telling you guys in, in the future, I think, and I was just talking to one of my old friends who's a doc now, but was a paramedic, is we think sometime you're going to be start doing some ultrasounds on the EMS. You know, x-rays include radiation and heavy stuff. Ultrasounds, I actually, in our ER right now, we have an ultrasound that hit, hooks into your iPhone, and it's as good, if not better, than some of them. And this is actually from this. And so real quick, we're going to give you a little bit of a tutorial on the ultrasound. And again, this is, I just show you these things because I, I think you're going to be using them in the future. They're easy to do. I'm not that smart and I'm 30 years into this. And so I'm the old dog learning new tricks. So this is a normal ultrasound. You know, it just kind of looks, you looks, we call it shimmering. You see the beach here, these lines, and it's kind of shimmering. So that's a normal ultrasound. When you start getting somebody with pneumonia or congestive heart failure, what you start seeing is what I call comet tails. So you still see the shimmering there, you know, that sort of, you know, you can see the movement there. That's called lung sliding, but you can see the shimmering. But here you see a little less in the shimmering, and these are called B lines, these vertical lines. And this is what you'll see in congestive heart failure and pneumonia. And this is a mild case. So what it, that is, is reduced aeration of the lung sliding, okay? So these are called B lines. And then as they get sicker, these B lines get heavier and that you can see our shimmering we can see over here is almost gone. And then here when they get a collapsed lung or really bad pneumonia, this over here is the liver, but you see no shimmering at all. You see just basically no movement. The B lines are even gone. This is somebody who's either got a collapsed lung or is really sick. So, I mean, this took to do this study is to put it on them in 30 seconds. So you could tell in 30 seconds, a collapsed lung, pneumonia, or congestive heart failure. You may not be able to differentiate it, but you could get a sense um, where they're at. And sometimes I use it, especially if I'm worried, is it congestive heart failure or is it COPD? You know, it's sometimes hard to tell. So that's a cool way. And I think that's going to be something you're going to be doing because they're only the size of, you know, your hand and your iPhone or your, uh, your Android. So treatment uh, for COVID is always changing. How many times it changed? We had weekly meetings. Initially, we were intubating early. Now we don't. What we really found that's helped is the heated high flow nasal cannula. And if you've seen it, it's not just turn the oxygen up to 100%. It's on the nasal cannula. It's a whole system of fluid and heating that. BiPAP has been more successful as well. You've heard about proning where they're, you know, laying on their stomach when they're awake, which helps the secretions and it seems to help their breathing. Obviously, the ventilator has been used quite a bit. And an ECMO, if you're not, uh, com not sure of that, then I, I, we started doing it only recently and I have zero experience with it. But that's sort of breathing through an IV. Basically, it's extra corpuscle medical. I, now I can't remember, just blanked out on it. But ECMO is basically they put a, a central line and they basically oxygenate your lung, uh, bypassing your lung, but oxy, oxygenate your body. Essentially, bypassing your lung is the is the short version of it. Okay. 
So this is something that U of M does and Henry Ford done and St. Joe does somewhat, but actually we don't even do it 24 hours a day. So it's a cool bypass and you're going to hear more about this in the future. And some of you may have already taken ECMO patients to other pay places, sort of like we have at St. Joe where they do it only certain parts of the day and then they transfer them to a bigger site. So ECMO is part of the future, but I can't tell you a whole lot about it because I haven't dealt with it, but I know that saved a couple of life, which I'll tell you about in a minute. So again, the, commu the, the, the meds continue to change. You may hear about rendesivir. One thing you might uh, be able to give to somebody if you need to is dexamethasone. It's a steroid. It's a longer acting one. Uh, one day of prednisone is equal, one day of, one dose of dexamethasone is equal to three days of prednisone. So it's a longer acting. The benefits are that it helps with the inflammation as you might expect from, you know, COVID causes inflammation. The risk there is it seems to prolong the infectious stage. So we're only using it in people who have an oxygen dependency. Now I got in a, a discussion with a lady from Ohio who told me that she now knows why Michigan's so far behind because they are not treating COVID patients with antibiotics. Well, COVID's a virus. Antibiotics, you guys know, doesn't work on COVID and on, on viruses. So I'm not sure what she's talking about, but uh, so, okay, we don't use antibiotics. So they were using azithromycin for a while, but that seemed to fall off. We are using anticoagulation because I have seen a bunch of PEs from COVID. Key, uh, COVID seems to be causing some clotting problems and it can be delayed. So you may see a PE come from the ambulance who had COVID a few weeks or months ago. Uh, so anticoagulation, sometimes it's just aspirin and sometimes it's more like heparin, which you may have transported people with. And then monoclonal antibodies are the one, there's the BAMs and the MABs, and they change all the time too as they get more research done because all this is an ongoing research project. But you'll hear, and we were given monoclonal antibodies, the ones we were given was called BAM-BAM. Um, so they seem to help people with mild cases who... Um, we would send home, but we give them this infusion. Other medicines, the hydroxychloroquine did not show, did not work in spite of what some people say. Our hospital was part of the research and we stopped it very early. Uh, we got no improvement and had more side effects. So uh, we don't use it. There's others that are out there. Zinc doesn't seem to help. Vitamin C doesn't seem to help. And there's a couple others right now. You know, the monoclonal antibiotics and steroids and then some rendesivir, which is an antiviral type medicine, seem to be what's going, but it could change next week. So remember, it, you know, what's, diff what's a differential on these cases? What else could prevent like that? Well, in my 30 years, the only thing I've ever seen that has lost a taste and smell is COVID. I've never seen anything else completely lose taste and smell. Occasionally sinus infections will. So influenza. So that's been the most specific thing that, you know, if they have that, I almost, almost a hundred percent for sure have COVID. Influenza can be confused. We had no influenzas when we tested them and many of the swabs we were doing covered both COVID and influenza. So we had a zero influenza a year. The upper, the cold is different as well. You know, the fever's not there, the body aches, it's just runny nose, cough, sore throat. Viral illnesses can be Obviously, COVID inflammation could turn into not just COVID pneumonia, but bacterial pneumonia. So that's a possibility. And, you know, CHF pulmonary edema, you know, sometimes COPD and asthma will sound like CHF. So it's not always easy for me or you guys in the field to differentiate those. So those are things, other things you might think of. But if you got lost the taste and smell, I'm pretty comfortable that you can say that they have COVID before the test. What are they finding in these kids? They're finding fevers, 44% are having fevers. That's lower than you think because every one of you had to go through a temperature check at least once and it has never correlated well with them. What has is the cough, fatigue, loss of taste and smell. Not everybody gets it, but everybody who gets it seems to have COVID. Shortness of breath, that's 80%. Body aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It didn't seem to start with the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. The first cases were respiratory, but as we got testing more, we found more and more people were having the GI symptoms too. And believe it or not, they had a worse outcome with diarrhea associated with COVID. So they seem to get sicker, okay? Keith's cases specifically didn't seem to get as sick. 
they didn't get severe symptoms as often. So they weren't as sick usually. And then the severe symptoms were they had to be hospitalized were less than that. And then the deaths were fairly rare, but we did have one kid who came to our hospital who had heart damage from COVID and had to get a heart transplant. So there is some problems with the, you know, COVID has caused some terrible things. And, and what I'm gonna tell you now is COVID is here to stay. I think it's gonna come back, I may be wrong. I think we're gonna get cycles of it like the flu. And the problem is these long haulers, we'll talk a minute about in a few, in a few minutes, but these long haulers are having problems. We have a friend of ours, a friend of somebody I went to high school with, their coach was a healthy 44 year old non-smoker. He got COVID, he got really sick, he got really, really sick. He got intubated. He got trached. He got put on the ECMO because he was, and they were giving him last rites. Then they talked to a bigger hospital, Henry Ford, and they transferred him there. And he just got a double lung transplant. He had to have his lung transplants only from COVID. And this is, I, I, I know of a marathoner who had that, a very healthy competitive marathoner. So you know, if you were lucky enough not to see COVID, say your prayers, okay, because you were lucky. We saw some of the worst of the worst. So it was bad and it was really bad for some people. And some people are going to have this long haulers. One thing I specifically want to talk to you about, just to touch on a little bit and not to go in great detail, but it's called MIS-C, M-I-S-C is how you'll see it. And what it is, is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. It's an inflammation of organs. So we're getting end organ damage. Maybe it's the lungs, maybe it's the belly, maybe it's the kidneys, maybe it's the heart. So these kids are getting this and some of them actually getting neurological symptoms and they have almost looks like a stroke. They'll have uh, paralysis, they'll have not able to move and it happens up to four weeks after the COVID exposure or the positive COVID. It looks a little like Kawasaki's or, or it should say, or toxic shock syndrome. And you guys are, I'm sure, scared of toxic shock syndrome as I am, where their pressure plummets, their heart rate goes bad and they die on you. So these kids and adults, but these kids, especially with this Miss C can get really, really sick. And again, sick. And again, up to four weeks after symptoms. Okay. GI forms, there's abdominal pain, they get the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, in which we talked about the diarrhea seems to have a worse outcome. They will get rashes, they'll get ulcers inside their mouth, they'll get bacterial endocarditis like we talked about, or uh, pericarditis, and this inflammation, this inflammatory process will damage the heart or around the heart. And like I said, the one had to have a transplant um, of their heart, um, and this was a young, I, I think uh, my partner told me she's about a seven-year-old. Um, you can get neurologic com complications, uh, almost like MS. They'll have paralysis, they'll have weakness, they'll have confusion, they'll have cloudiness, they'll have fatigue so bad that they can't even get out of bed. Some of them have been parallel. That's where some of it started was paralysis of the lower extremities. So this can be bad. And I just want you to know about it if you see a weird case after COVID, okay? And again, fever, swollen lymph nodes, rashes, abdominal pains, pink eyes, conjunctivitis, ulcers in the mouth, uh, edema of the legs, heart inflammation. You may hear a rub when you listen to their heart, this kind of weird squeaky sound in their heart alone. They will get hypotensive and shocky on you. And how we diagnose this is a whole plethora of inflammatory markers we call the sed rate and the C-reactive protein. So these aren't something you can do in, in the ambulance and something I have to look up every time. But if you see a sick kid with weird symptoms that had COVID, you know, mention that to us so we can put our, put, put our thinking cap on and get that checked out, okay? Most are well prior. These kids get really sick. Believe it or not, even if they get really, really, really sick, 85% will recover completely within 10 days. 60% of them that had the heart symptoms will end up with the heart symptoms. 75% were admitted. 75% of those that got sick were admitted to the PICU. 17% were on vents. And the treatment for this is going to be steroids we talked about already. Which it's an inflammatory process. And IVIG is, a, is an immune globulin. So it's sort of where the body's attacking these symptoms because of the COVID. So these, these 
organs, the, the inflammatory process, the body sort of having a reaction. So the immune globulins help to reverse that. So that's, you know, two seconds on a two hour lecture, but that just gives you an idea that there's some bad things out there still and to be wary of them. Okay. Long-term sequela, both for kids and adults are lung disease, heart, lung transplants, heart attacks, strokes, kidney failure, dialysis, uh, uh, long haulers have this fatigue, this brain cloudiness, and they're now even seeing some PTSD type symptoms on people. And it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of this disease is very poorly understood and there's bad stuff out there. So, and then please be aware the Delta variant right now that we have it is coming. If you haven't been immunized, please consider doing it. I've gotten them both. My entire family has them both even my distant family, we had no side effects other than a tired and body aches and a little fever, some of us, but uh, please consider it because these variants are, are, are even more contagious. This Delta variant that came from, uh, from um, uh, India is very virulent and not necessarily deadly, maybe a little more, but it, there's going to be more variants as we don't hit the herd immunity, okay? So, this is my team Fauci dog, Baxter. Um, if nobody has any quick questions, I will keep going and then answer them at the end because I am talk too much. So next patient you'll get is a, is a 10-year-old. This is a young lady who's got abdominal pain, fever, and nausea started a day or so ago. She can't keep anything down. She's really nauseated. She's not eating or drinking anything. And her pain is in the right upper quadrant, you know? So it's kind of the, not the appendicitis look to it. You're, you're on call, so you get called to the house and you notice that she's really tender in the right upper quadrant. Mom says it's been going on for two days. She's got a little fever, 100.6, a little runny nose, nausea, vomiting, but she's also got a little cough, not too unusual with kids. Sometimes that gallbladder or the liver can irritate the lungs or the diaphragm and cause a little cough. But she notices that the abdominal pain worsens when she coughs. Your exam, you look at her nose and throat, they look good. Her lungs are a little junky sounding, but really nothing exciting doesn't get you too worried. You push on her tummy again, and it's real tender in the right upper quadrant. Her back's normal. She's got a one-on-one -on -one temp. She's a little tachypnic. You didn't really expect that. She's uh, tachycardic, but she's vomiting. So, but her sat's a little lower than you expected. So what are you going to do next? Okay. So you're going to, you do the, oops, so we'll go what you're going to do. You're going to maybe start an IV in her, give her some fluids, maybe give her some acetaminophen if you got it, or Zofran if you have some on the rig, and just kind of help her symptoms. If you're worried about the ronchi or that kind of coarse sound in her lungs, you may give her a breathing treatment. I'm a big proponent of albuterol. Almost nobody gets hurt with it. And it helps people, even with just a plain old cough, I'll give it to them and they'll, they'll, they'll say, I feel a lot better. So even if you don't hear wheezing, so you may do that just to see what happens, okay? So in ED, we evaluate her, looks the same as you told me, tender in the right upper quadrant. I tried a little buterol. She said her coughing's better. We gave her some, you gave her nausea medicine, so she's better. You may have given her a little pain better, so her abdomen's not quite as tender. The blood work shows a little bit of a white count. Uh, liver functions look okay. So we're not quite sure what's going on. So we did a chest x-ray and an abdominal film on her. This is kind of old school. Usually we do an ultrasound now, but this is kind of old school. And I was shocked at what I found. So on the left is your normal chest x-ray we showed earlier. The dark is the, the, the air and the white is the tissue, but you look at her right lower lobe and there's a pneumonia sitting there. Okay. And that wasn't my, wasn't my first thought was pneumonia. She had, you know, it's not uncommon for pneumonia to have abdominal pain. Some people with uh, pneumonia will have some wheezing, some won't, some will have that ronchi course sound, some won't. So, wow, a surpriser. And I've actually seen the opposite where somebody comes in with chest pain and shortness of breath, and it was their gallbladder. So remember, pneumonia can mimic abdominal pain, not uncommon. Abdominal pain or chest pain can mimic pneumonia. Look at the symptoms and compare your exam. If your exam doesn't make any sense, you know, look past what you think you're doing and look for other symptoms. You know, she mentioned the cough. She kind of put it off, but maybe the cough was your key there. Maybe not. Some people with pneumonia don't even cough and they'll have a terrible look in pneumonia regardless of COVID. 
Okay, so treatment inhaler, I like to use acetaminophen, ibuprofen, cough medicine in kids is a no-no. Any kid above one, it, the pediatric society doesn't want you to give anybody above, I think 12, any of the cough medicines over the counter or even anything with narcotics in it. And I'm talking about your kids like codeine. Um, they recommend honey, vaporizer, a cool mist vaporized in the room. And then of course, if it's bacterial pneumonia, which most of these are gonna be other than COVID times, we'll put them on antibiotics, usually azithromycin covers them, Keflexo covers them. So just some you know, antibiotics, we, we kind of watch our, our area to see which is the best coverage for each area has a better coverage. And then a patient like this can be discharged. Now, this is one of my, fa I work at a shelter when I'm not working hard in the ER. And this is one of my favorite dogs of the shelter of all times. This is Prince Charming. Prince Charming, as you can see, his back legs are a little funny. He was paralyzed from the waist down, but this dog was a puppy. He was maybe eight to 12 weeks old when he was in, in the shelter when I saw him and he could walk on his two front legs and drag his legs in the middle of the winter to go to the bathroom and control it. So uh, just like you guys, uh, Prince Charming was one of my heroes. All right, next, and we're getting, we're getting there. This kid is at high school. He's um, running his mile like we all had to do at high school to be timed in gym class. And while he was doing, he got sharp pain in his coach, as most of our coaches say, you know, rub some dirt on it, rub it off. Don't be a baby. You just got a little cramp. OK, but this kid's a little different. He's a little more short of breath. So coach says, yeah, he's just a baby, but we'll call the ambulance. You know, we got to we got to protect ourselves against the kids. So you get called to the scene and he's a little more shortness and breath than you'd expect it. He's got a sharp pain in his in his chest. And it hurts more when he breathes. You get him to admit that he smokes a few cigarettes every day, maybe a pack a week. Uh, he's an athletic kid. So he's an athletic runner like I used to be in high school. And he's about six foot tall and weighs 120 pounds. So he's tall and thin. Um, he's got no health problems. He's not asthmatic. He's never had any problems. And he never really had any problems until he started running this mile in gym class. Was fine the rest of the day. Vitals, he's tachycardic too. His sat's really low and you don't expect that. His respiratory rate sees tachypnic. His heart sounds good other than the tachycardia. His lungs seem to be okay. You know, it's a little loud because all the kids are excited there and his belly is nice and soft, okay? So what are you gonna do with this kid? This kid, you're gonna put on some oxygen because he's, uh, you know, he's below 92%. You're gonna put a line in him because it's not making sense. And maybe you give a little morphine or if you have Toradol or, you know, a little low dose ketamine to kind of chill him out and make his chest pain feel better. But I'm not really sure what's going on yet. Okay, so let's take the same scenario and look at the patient. But look, this time, this is what's added on. Same vital signs, really hurts, but then, this arrow, and, and always remember in medicine, if there's an arrow on an x-ray, if there's an arrow on a CT, if there's an arrow on a salt and a ultrasound, or there's an arrow on a picture, something's wrong. It's hard to tell this, and if anybody really gets this, I'll be happy, but what this is, is tracheal deviation. So you got the same scenario, this time you see tracheal deviation, and there was not a good picture of the skin with tracheal deviation. So what are you going to do now? Okay, this is different. This is, this is the same thing, but this guy's got no breath sounds on the right, on the left, I'm sorry, pushing everything to the right, um, hit, or pushing everything to the left, no breath sounds on the left. His abdomen's still negative. He's even more short of breath. He's tachypnic and tachycardic. What workup are you going to do in the ambulance? You're not going to do anything but your physical exam. You don't hear any breath sounds. You don't have a chest x-ray available. Maybe in the future you'll have an ultrasound, but you have to act now. This is not something that can wait, right? This is something you have to act. So what my first patient had was a pneumothorax, okay? And what that is, is his lung completely collapsed. You see air here, and then you see these white little things. These are our lung markings, okay? This one, you can see his ribs and you can see his air, and maybe you can see a little lung marking, but you see it almost like a crumpled up tissue over here. And this is what his lung is completely collapsed and he's got no air there. This patient is our second patient, not exactly, but this is our second patient. This guy's lung is collapsed and you can see his trachea 
because of this air pushing is pushing his trachea and his, uh, his trachea over to the left here. So he's got normal lung here and he's got nothing but air here. So this is tracheal deviation and he's got a, pneumo, a spontaneous pneumothorax. So again, real quick, normal seashore sign. This is an ultrasound. This one, you can you don't see the shimmering because I don't have active, but it kind of looks like a beach. And this is sort of looking at the sun into the sunset, you know, nice and smooth, nice and easy. And then when you look at a pneumothorax, you see the ribs. So this, so these are the ribs here over on the first one and the shimmering would be right there. This is, there's nothing shimmering here. And these are the ribs that will show up kind of black. And there's, you lose some of this up here. So this looks more like a barcode when you go to the grocery store here. And that's a finding of, of uh, pretty amazing though, isn't it? There's a big difference here and it's only an ultrasound that took you two seconds to do. So they call it stratosphere or barcoding. This is definitely different than this. And this is, I know is normal because I've seen a few of them. So what are you gonna do? You gotta do a new needle thoracostomy in this kid because his lungs collapsing, is pushing his heart to the side and it's causing him to breathe poorly. So <clears throat> when I did EMS a hundred years ago and even when I started as a PA in the emergency department, we would even then would do a needle, needle thoracostomy. They still teach that ATLS. Now what we did was a mid clavicular. So here's the collarbone and we'd go about halfway down the collarbone and find about the one, two, three innered space. And we would stick a needle, an 18 gauge angiocath or large or 16 gauge angiocath or larger in there. Sometimes they even make them for you guys. I know they're specific for this. And you try to, you know, basically stick the needle in there until you hear the air rush out. Now, I don't know about you guys, but as I've aged, I've gained a little bit of weight and Michigan uh, itself seems to have gained a lot of weight. And now back when I started, we didn't have, you know, 400 pound patients. So what the new studies are showing is actually if you do the anterior axillary line, you can see the depth of the lung. So the lung on the mid clavicular line is 4.28 centimeters deep. So you got to have a longer needle where on average, the depth in the anterior axillary line is about 3.42. So the recommendation are a little bit lower. You can see we're at one, two, three, four, five, five, six area between the fifth and sixth ribs. And we're more lateral, we're more to the outside. So the ax, you know, the axilla, as you know, is the armpit. So we're right, kind of right even with the armpit going down the chest wall down and then you're much, you have a better chance of doing it and you will hopefully not get to the lung either way. But there's, with our people getting heavier and more adipose tissue, this is gonna be maybe where you wanna put it unless it's a skin person. So I'm not gonna go over the procedure. Oh, crap. But basically you clean it up, you make a little flutter valve. If it comes with there, you put a finger of a glove on there, tape it on there, you stick it in there so that it blow, you know, you can decompress it and you can do, and you can um, reinflate the lung. Now, the one thing I did wrong on mine is I put it in there, drained it when I first took ATLS the first time and I was really nervous and then I took the needle out and what happened? It filled right back up. So you need to leave the needle in there until you get a chest tube in, okay? So again, treatment for the chest tubes, if you don't have to do uh, needle decompression is oxygen, sedation, uh, ultrasound can help you. We're doing now something called a serratus block, which is where we infiltrate using ultrasound lidocaine, or we use a long acting lidocaine and we can actually numb the ribs up completely. So they have no pain. And then we'll do a ch chest foods. Now, many of may have seen the traditional ones, the big old, huge ones we put between the ribs, which hurt like hell. If you ever had one, we'll do a pigtail now, which is a little tiny, uh, catheter we put in there and and that'll a small one, basically, <clears throat> unless there's a lot of blood, that's what they're using now more often. And then sometimes if they're small enough, we'll monitor them. Uh, so that's kind of just sort of the, the pneumothorax and the tension pneumothorax. And they will happen spontaneously. There doesn't have to be any trauma. And again, like we talked about, they usually are tall, thin people. Okay. And so this is the cause of the real cause of the extinction of dinosaurs. And I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to go on to the next one. This is this is just a story. I don't have a lot of slides with them. This is our Cree kid. So this case happened in northern Canada. The closest ER by car is 10 hours. The closest ER 
except for this little tiny one by helicopter or fixed wing airplane is six hours. So this is not rural, this is rural, rural. So they saw this little kid who came in with vital signs. Mom has no idea, kid was fine. All of a sudden she noticed that the kid was not breathing very well, okay? Really quiet, had strider. Um, um, but she really, you know, she looks sick here, but all the rest of her seemed to be fine. She was unusually quiet. Her, her, so what did the EMS people brought her in, but they had no idea that she kind of got put at the back of the line um, because she didn't look sick. And the triage nurse said, you know, triage her because it was a busy little tiny ER. So they put her in the back. So the doc finally gets to her and they can't figure out what's going on. The kid's not saying anything. So they did chest x-ray and it looked okay. And then she looked again and she saw a tiny little sliver of metal. She wasn't sure what it was. And this was only an AP view, which is kind of looking at the front view. So they decided to do a cross table on her and they saw this. This is a hair clip, which when open looks like a V. When closed, you know, it, it closes down. So this was open in her upper airway, sort of near the epiglottis area. So it was kind of mimicking what we talked about epiglottitis without all the fever and stuff. Okay, so... They talked to the ENT at the eight hour away hospital and they said, don't, don't, you don't try to get this because if you push it down, it's going to get worse. It's going to get hung up because it was open pointing down. So you need to transfer her. Well, as this Dr. Vanessa Carty, who's the doctor who did this case up in Northern Canada, said that she called the helicopter. And as you might expect, the helicopter was having air problems because the weather was terrible. Um, they were they had no ENT, they had no anesthesiologist, they had nobody but the ER sla doctor slash internal medicine or pediatrician internal medicine doctor. The closest ER was 10 hours away by car and six hours away by plane. With the weather bad, it was 16 hours away to the nearest children hospital, which was in Tor Toronto, 16 hours away by road and eight hours away by car, and they weren't flying yet. So what did they do? They did what we would do in epiglottitis. They gave her some steroids. They gave her an IV, kept her hydrated, and kept her calm. They kept her very calm. Well, finally, they got some clearing in the clouds. They um, were able to get the helicopter up. They transferred her to McGill, which is the big pediatric hospital in Toronto, and they were able to pull that out without causing any damage. And she came back up to, you know, the top of the world and she did just fine. So that story, I want to give you an idea because I have so much respect for rural PAs, nurse practitioners, physicians, and you guys in the rigs, because you guys, it's hard. It's, it's harder. I think a lot of times, even though it's not necessarily busier, but it's harder a lot of times for you because you have less resources and farther transport times. So I always try to have pearls of wisdom. My pearls of wisdom today are ultrasound is in your future. I think your H&P, as we talked about on many of these things, you don't have access to tests. So your H&P can help you key. The oxygen line is 92%. Strider equals scary. The saturation, though, may be a late finding. Remember, even if they look, if they look like crap and their sat's still good, you need to think about it again. I didn't really focus on that as much as I should have. But remember, the saturation can be a late finding. COVID is here to stay, I think. Needle, needle thoracostomy may better, be better in the anterior axillary line than in the anterior cl midclavicular line. And as I said, my rural medicine people are heroes and you guys are included in that, okay? So if you guys are up to it, I know we're a couple minutes over. If you're up to it, we can do a game. It's only five questions. It'll take us about a minute. I have a prize of $25 of uh, Amazon for first place. It's fun. The questions are not hard. So if you guys kind of click on either the Kahoot image here, or if you want to put this in your computer or your iPhone or your whatever, I'm going to give you a minute to do that while I click on to this site so I can load the game. Like I said, it'll only take a couple minutes. I'll give you a couple minutes to get signed in and then we'll get a prize and then we'll try to answer questions. And I apologize for going long, but I hopefully it was worth your extra time. Give me a second here and go. I'm going to click over to another site. Just one second. 
Is it okay and, if I squeeze in a question here while you're switching over? We have yeah. And this right here, again, this is the Wesley Krupp score, and this is where that number's based on. So again, it's MD Calc. It's a free app, and it's kind of nice to have. It's got a whole bunch of stuff. This is going to take me a minute because it's kind of goofy how this goes. Okay. So go ahead and ask. Okay, Jeff, uh, we had a question from the audience regarding the COVID case with COVID positive patients. The question yep. was, what are the expected lung sounds? What are the trends you've been hearing for lung sounds and oxygen saturations? So oxygen saturations are the lowest I have ever seen in my entire life. I have seen sats of people who look okay in their 50s. And I am not kidding you. We checked it with multiples and they don't look that terrible. Um, so the sats have been extremely low. I mean, 80s is low, but I've seen 50s and 60s more than once on people that would you normally you'd see as dead, okay? So they've been extremely low. I'm gonna put it here. And then the other thing is um, the lung sounds have been the whole gamut, clear, ronchi, and wheezing, okay? And asthmatics, believe it or not, don't seem to do as do any worse than anybody else, so they'll have more wheezing. All right, let's see if this will work. So those of you that are still on, you are more than welcome to stay and play the game or hop off. I know there's some concern sometimes if you hop off at seven, if you'll get your CE. You oh, are yeah. only required to stay until seven. So if you do hop off, you will get your CE, no worries there, but I encourage you to stay if you can, because um, this will only take a few minutes and then yeah. we'll, we'll let you go. All right, so all you have to do is go to either the Kahoot app or the Kahoot.it and put this number in, it'll ask you for the number. And I can tell when you're coming up, you can use a generic name, you don't have to use your real name, but um, I can tell when you start to come up. And if it doesn't work, I'll just show you the quiz. Uh, oh, they're saying kind of there's a pen request. That's the pin number right here, 2.88999989. Can you see that? Oh, no, I can't. I can't okay, see so that. Okay, let so me, let me change the screen a bit. I apologize. I thought when no I worries. changed, it would do it. If you want to read that to me again, too, I could type it in the chat box. Two point, or it's 2.88999. 2.88999. And it should bring up the game. There you go, guys. All right. Sorry, guys. Let me get this so it shows up. There you go. I can see you signing in. All right. So let me see if I can share screen. Uh, here we go. Nope. Share screen again. Here we go. Here it is. There you go. Can you see your names? I can see it. Okay. So whenever I get a few more net names in there or when it seems to stop, I'll start it. You got 10 seconds for each question. Speed is what wins the thing. The questions, don't overthink them. They're really meant to be super easy and make this fun. When I do this with my uh, residents and my fellows and my students, they all kind of get real competitive. So it's just kind of fun. And it's only five questions and you only got 10 seconds, okay? Oh, well, there's a there's a gift card at stake here. There's a gift card too, okay? And I'll just mail it, email it to you, and you can use it. So it looks like I got a hold. If anybody is what else wants to do it, tell me to hold on. But otherwise, I'm going to start the game. I have you a see? question. Yes, please. Uh, I um trying to figure out how to, has has Kathy Moffat come up. I'm trying to figure out how to do the pin number, and I, I've got the game in front of me. I don't see a Kathy Moffat. Do you? Andrea? Um, yeah, I saw you sign in. Do you see the pin number typed in the chat box by any chance? It should be on your game yeah. too. I saw your name too. I swear I saw it. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah. Every once in a while, this get there. No, not yet. Oh, Kathy, you're, um, you're muted. You're muted. Still muted. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to double unmute it. <laughs> and again, I apologize if you have any problems. Every once in a while, I get a quirk where one person can't sign in. Mm -hmm. 
And some people see nothing. Ah, poop. Can so you see my... Be, it could be your browser too. It could be your connection. Um, it looks like, I mean, you have people in and, and submitting on your end, right, Jeff? Oh yeah. I can okay. see Brian Mathis, old paramedic, Deb H., Andrea, Charles. So I can see most of the names here. I got 22 people right now. Okay. Yeah, we apologize if you're having any technical difficulties. Um, sometimes that happens. Meanwhile, while we're waiting on these last few, there was one other question that dropped into the chat box. It was, does a child appear cyanotic uh, with COVID? Like, I'll I'll be honest, I haven't seen a lot of COVID little kids, luckily, thank God. Um, they have been, some of them have been, but believe it or not, most of them don't look that bad when their sets are that crappy too. So it has been seen, it's been reported, but I haven't seen it and it's not been as common as you'd expect it. Okay. Do you think we got everybody who wants to play? I'm on Kahoot. Yeah, that'll probably happen. So you, you probably will only be able to see Kahoot while you're in Kahoot and that's okay, yeah. Okay, can you hear me at all? Oh, I can now hear, I can you. hear you, hello. Okay, I'm, I'm calling from the, I'm contacting you from the UP and sometimes it's spotty reception up here. Oh yeah, I bet. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm able to play the game or not. I mean, I see it in front of me. Has Kathy Moffat come up yet or is it still not there? No, I don't see it. I see your name on the thing in the chat, but not in the game. Oh rats. Well, okay, I'm not sure what else to do. <laughs> I apologize. We'll That's promise. All right. We'll get you next time. Okay. All right. I'll Okay. Sorry, guys, but you can, you can play in your head. <laughs> We're going to start it now. It'll only take a few minutes, but it's kind of fun. Okay, here we go. This is a Kahoot. Rural EMS paramedic. I'll try to read the questions if you can't see them very well. The question is going to be, what is this an x-ray of? And just click on the box, the blue, the red, the green, or the yellow. And this might actually have extra answers. Okay, so it's really quick, like I told you. So I apologize. So the answer was COVID. And actually the other answer was, you can't read, I don't know how to read x-rays because I'm no paramedic. So anyway, so unfortunately it didn't work great for everybody. We got three people got it right. And Josh is in the lead right now because Josh did it the fastest, okay? So again, click on the picture if you have it. I apologize if it's not working. Next time we'll get it to work better. And next question is gonna start now. This is a true false. Pulse ox rules out respiratory emergencies if it's normal. Is that true or false? Yeah, great, so false. It doesn't rule it out. Like we said, it can be late delayed. The pulse ox changes. So, um, so 15 people got it right. And it looks like G money is in first place right now, okay? Again, don't make these too hard and answer as quick as you can. Next question is, true or false? With Strider's child, you should always use a tongue blade to examine their throat. True or false? So remember, with epiglottitis, if you use a tongue blade, you can agitate them and cause that to swell. So I wanted false as the answer. So false, and let's see who's in first place. It's going to be G Money still in first place at 22.77. You can still catch up. All right. So next is COVID can affect which of the following? Lungs, heart, neuro, or all of the above? Awesome, you guys did better than my students did. So all of the above, let's see how we're doing now. G Money is, oh, he lost his, he or she lost his lead to Deb H. So this is the last question, okay? I got so excited when I played this game that I put the wrong answer down even though I knew it. So the big money's coming now. Okay, this is gonna be a little question. What is your treatment of this problem? Uh-oh. 
So let me go back here if I can. That says it right there, that's a tension pneumothorax. So what was the treatment for a tension pneumothorax? It was a needle, okay? So sorry, I'd made it harder than I thought, but who's our winner? The podium goes to, so third place goes to M&M and &M, M. Second place goes to G Money. And the winner is Deb H. So Deb H, the next, the next slide will be my email address. You can send me an email and I'll send you a card over your email, okay? I hope you had fun. I'll try to make it fun next time. Um, people get competitive and I push the wrong buttons. I try to make it easy, but sometimes I fool myself. Okay, so that was Kahoot. I can't see your slides anymore, by the way. I'm gonna put it up right now. I gotta okay. change the, the thing now. And those of you that have hung out, I'm dropping the quiz link directly. It will direct you right to the quiz in the chat box. So here that comes. And then I'm going to stop streaming. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. So this is, this is my email. Uh, the winner, please send me an email. The rest of you, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them. I like, I like working with you guys. Um, and I, uh, like I said, I did it 100 years ago and things have changed. So does anybody, let's see if I can get your pictures up. Anybody, anybody have any questions? Can, can you see the slides? Can anybody see the slides? It's Am still I not coming there? up. Yeah, I don't see them, but I, I want to be sure okay. it's not just me. Um, just a second. Sometimes when I share, I got to, let's try this one. Okay, there. there's a no. Oh, you can? You can see his, why am I not seeing anything weird? Hmm. Let me try one more thing here, you guys. Oh, I was in a different mode. Sorry, that was me, Jeff. I'm okay, gonna... let's see here. Now let me get it back. Um, so, can you see it now, Andrea? My yes. email? Okay. Yes. I apologize to Catherine Moffat. We may give her a, uh, a, a, a what do you call it? A, 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 a surprise for her participation. <laughs>